Stephen, I, like you, have had a lifelong passion to understand what the nature of reality is. And when we look at reality, the first thing we notice is that there is great diversity, great complexity. So let's focus on that and, and ask, how could such complexity come about? Well, I think it's, it's in a sense kind of humiliating for us as humans that if we are presented, let's say, with two objects and we're told one of them is from nature, mm -hmm. one of them is something that we as humans have created, that it's a pretty good guess that the one that looks simpler will be the one that we as humans have created. Mm -hmm. And yet, with our whole sort of history of civilization and so on, somehow we haven't managed to capture the secret that nature seems to have that lets it apparently quite mm. effortlessly create all the kind of complexity that we see. So one thing I've been very interested in is to try and sort of home in on what that secret that nature has is. It's, it's kind of a, a very basic mystery in, in science. I thought 25 years ago when I started really thinking seriously about this kind of thing that with all of the fancy physics and mathematics and so on that I knew that this kind of basic mystery of science would be easy mm. to crack, mm. that, uh, that it would be from I'd be able to use some mathematical method, let's say, to be able to say um, this is how nature manages to do the things it does. Um, I didn't manage to do that, and I kind of sort of started zooming out to try and see kind of what, what could it be about kind of the foundations of the way that I was thinking about things that uh, didn't let me kind of crack what seemed like a very basic scientific question. Mm -hmm. What I realized was, was this, that if we are to have any theory of this kind of thing, it has to be the case that nature follows some kind of definite rules. But the issue is, have the rules that we have learnt from sort of the development of mathematics and so on, are those the rules that nature is really using, or is nature using some other kind of rule? And what I, what I kind of realized is that we have to sort of start thinking about what are all the possible rules that nature might, might conceivably use to do what it does. They might not happen to be the rules that we, as humans, have set up in our mathematics and in the development of our science. And so I kind of started looking at the question of if we look at sort of all possible rules that nature might be using, what can we see out there? What can we find in, in sort of the space of all possible rules? And Not limiting yourself to the traditional mathematics or physics. Right, right. And so, so in modern times, we have kind of a good foundation to think about all possible rules. We have computers and computer programs, mm -hmm. and we can kind of imagine looking at sort of all the possible programs, each one corresponding to a different rule for how things get made. Mm -hmm. And we can ask the question, in the space of all possible computer programs, what's out there and how does it compare with what we see in nature? And so I started 25 years ago now to kind of investigate the simplest possible computer programs. It's kind of a strange thing because we're used to the idea that we make computer programs for particular purposes. You know, right. we, we make a program to, to perform some particular computation that we have in mind uh, a purpose for. Mm -hmm. We don't just think about uh, enumerating all possible programs and just seeing what they do. Um, but I decided it would be an important piece of basic science to try and just sort of enumerate the possible programs and, and see what's out there in the universe of possible programs. Well, my first assumption was that when the programs I was looking at were simple, then their behavior would somehow be correspondingly simple. That uh, if one wanted to make something complicated, that it would necessarily be the case that one had to sort of put something complicated in. That one couldn't get complexity out with nothing put in. So. I was fairly amazed when, when I actually did the experiment and found that uh, some of the programs that I looked at were very simple, did very simple things, but you just start enumerating possible programs by the time you're at, let's say, the 30th program. <laughs> that happens to be one that I particularly <coughs> like. You can number these programs. This is rule 30. Yeah. <laughs> um, you suddenly see a situation where you can start off from a very simple rule that you can specify in just a few bits of information. Um, you say, let's start the thing off from, let's say, one black cell in, in the kind of ways that the pictures are made. And suddenly, you see that out of this very simple rule, very simple starting condition, you get this pattern of great complexity. And the, the, this, is, this is something that certainly, I think it's sort of, it's, it's the single most remarkable thing that I've ever seen. What's particularly interesting is that if you look at that rule compared to other rules that look similar, you cannot see from the specification of the rule the complexity of one versus the simplicity of the other. It's, a, it's certainly impossible for me yes. as I look at them. Yes. Because they, they, they seem and sound the same. Right. 
Right, but it's, it's sort of what, one, what one's realizing is that if one goes and explores the sort of computational universe of possible programs, there are all kinds of creatures out there. Yeah. <laughs> there, are some, there are some creatures that are very simple. They look, you know, they look, they look very, uh, very straightforward. There are other creatures that are the most ornate and exotic creatures. Yeah. And there are fundamental things that can be said about the, our difficulty in deciding from the rule what, which, whether we'll be seeing an ornate exotic creature or a very simple creature. Yeah, but th that's almost, the way, they almost look the same, but it's how they perform and what they do that's different. Yes. I mean, if, if I had yes. to use a metaphor, I'd say, you know, looking at them superficially like, you know, different kind of, uh, I don't know, wolves or sheeps. I'm not, not sure what best me animal metaphor to use here. But when you see the kind of behaviors that they have, suddenly there'll be a huge difference between them. Yes. And that's, that's, that's yes. the well, this is excitement. Good. I think that the thing that I found most remarkable is that from you know, just sort of sampling out in the computational universe, one sees this great diversity of behavior, some simple, some very complex. And what, uh, what I found remarkable is that this seems to mirror very well what we see in nature. Mm. I think in a sense that that um, sort of sampling in the computational universe, um, we get to see the kinds of possible rules that nature can be using. When we as humans do kind of engineering, we tend to operate under the constraint that we have to readily foresee what the consequences <laughs> yeah. of what we build will yeah. be. Very good point. Um, but uh, nature operates under no such constraints, so it gets to kind of sample uh, much more arbitrarily the possible rules. And then there's this remarkable sort of fact of basic science that out of all the possible rules, many of them have this feature that even from great simplicity of the rule, the behavior that can be produced can be highly complex. Let, let's just take for a moment to, to define the difference between a behavior that's simple and complex. I think we're saying a simple behavior is, is repetitive, a, a repetitive pattern that just stays the same forever, so to speak. Right. And that's a simple pattern, and it really has no uh, uh, interest or utilitarian purpose. A complex pattern will then have a, a richness and a, and a story that, that may go on forever. Well, I think a very practical way to think about this is when you're presented with one of these patterns, mm -hmm. how easily can you summarize what you see in this pattern? Mm -hmm. If it's just, you say, a uniform black triangle, <laughs> okay, you're, you're done. <laughs> or you say it's a, it's a pattern that is you know, nested in some, some way, but you can sort of specify the nesting, and, and you say uh, you have a quick description that kind of gets you the, the, the complete mm -hmm. specification mm -hmm. of the pattern. Mm -hmm. When we say that things are, when we see things as complex, what's really going on is that we, as human analyzers of what we're seeing, uh, don't get very far. We, we can't sort of crush the thing we're seeing right. to some simple description. Right. We're just stuck with saying, well, it, it is what it is. Um, and we may be able to give some ornate description of, of, uh, uh, of what's there but we don't get to sort of uh, summarize everything in a matter of a sentence or two. And, and that's, I think, the, the sort of the operational definition of, of complexity. Right. And there's a fundamental question of sort of how can it be that these very simple underlying rules make something that we as humans are kind of unable to, to decode? Hmm. I mean, it, it could be, I mean, our, our basic sort of uh, intuition about things tends to be uh, when we see something complex, we assume that its cause must be somehow correspondingly complex, because that's been our experience mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. uh, with the things that we build, for mm -hmm. example. Um, but that that intuition uh, is the thing that, to my great surprise, I discovered is fundamentally not correct. Mm -hmm. um, that out in the sort of computational universe, it doesn't work that way. Instead, um, in the out in the computational universe, there are many instances where even though the underlying rules are extremely simple the behavior that emerges is highly complex. And radically different from a similar rule. Yes. And in principle, do you think you will, ever, you will ever be able to determine from the simple rule certain characteristics that could predict, or must you, the only way you could find out if you develop a simple or complex pattern is through testing it? And, there's, and in principle, you can't tell. Or, yes, well, this, this, uh, is, this is sort of a, a fundamental scientific fact that there's a, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of development that that goes into showing that this has to be the case. There's the sort of phenomenon that I call computational irreducibility mm -hmm. that kind of shows one that from the description, there is sort of an irreducible amount of computational work that has to go on to find out what consequences this, this simple description will have. So that means in principle, you can never be able to differentiate from those original simple rules, which will generate the complex rich patterns and which will generate just the, the simple repetition? Yes, that, that, that's true. I mean, there, there are certain cases in which you can say 
this particular one has some particular yeah. simplifying feature which uh -huh. makes it uh, kind of uh, completely incapable of doing anything interesting. Sure. But that's that's kind of the exception rather than the mm. rather than the mm. rule. We have complexity, I understand, but complexity doesn't mean meaningfulness. We can have many things very complex, completely devoid of meaning. Although many things that have great meaning are very complex. So how do we then go from complexity to something meaningful? Okay, <laughs> that's that's a that's there's quite a lot of layers that one has to <laughs> peel off to understand right. the, the the answer to that. I so when one's presented with something and one's asked, is this was this set up for a purpose? For example. There's a there's a sort of a, a this question of can one infer whether something was made for a purpose? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, for example, let's say one might think that if one saw something that was very simple, that one would immediately know that it was not made for a purpose. That's probably not correct. One of my favorite kind of parables about this is something I think due to Immanuel Kant. He said, if we see a hexagon drawn in the sand, we know that it must have been put there for a purpose. Mm. Now. What one then, uh, in modern times, uh, it's, it's, uh, people have noticed that there are these patterns of stones, for example, that arrange themselves in perfect hexagons <laughs> and do so by, by, as the result of sort of physical processes of wind and, and, and these sorts of things. So this kind of gives, gives a lie to what, what Kant mm -hmm. said mm -hmm. about this idea that you know, if, you, if you see this hexagon drawn in the sand, it must have been, been put there for a purpose. But this question of how do you, how do you recognize purpose in things it's a it's a really interesting question, and it kind of uh, it's also a complicated question. <laughs> um, the the in a sense when when we when we try to look at the natural world, one of the things that we in our civilization have done is to try and sort of mine the natural world for things that we can use for technology. We've tried to take things from the natural world and apply them to our particular human purposes, and that's something that has been done with lots of materials and things like that. Mm -hmm. What I think is an important phase in the future of technology will be mining the computational universe, will be mm -hmm. mining mm -hmm. sort of the space of all possible rules for making things and finding which of those rules are relevant for particular human purposes. In the history of our engineering so far, we've tended to follow some very definite motifs. We've got the idea of sort of rotary motion, levers, things like this. Um, these, these are very particular kinds of developments that have, have uh, happened historically. There's a whole sort of uh, uh, vast uh, computational universe of possible rules, possible ways to make things out there. And the, the, I think in the, in the future of technology, we'll see increasing use of these kind of more diverse ways to make things. And our, our intuition about um, when something has been created for a purpose versus not will probably change mm -hmm. as a result of us being quite familiar with technology that's been created in a quite different way than it's created today. Um, I actually think uh, one thing one can do when one thinks sort of scientifically and mathematically, one thinks about sort of the limits of things. And uh, you think about sort of the mathematical limit of, of uh, infinitely sophisticated technology. It's kind of an, an interesting thing to imagine. And I think in, in sort of that limit, what we perhaps might imagine is that every purpose that we have would be achieved in the most efficient, most optimal possible way. Now, as a matter of basic science, we can investigate right now what are the most optimal, most efficient ways to achieve particular kinds of simple purposes. So, for example, one thing that I've done is to kind of search the computational universe for optimal ways to perform particular computational tasks. Actually, in, in our uh, software, Mathematica, we, uh, we routinely use this kind of technique uh, to find sort of the optimal algorithms for things. They're not algorithms that any human would ever have created mm. as, a, as a piece of engineering. They're algorithms sort of plucked, mined from the computational universe mm. that are sort of optimal for their particular purposes. Mm. The remarkable thing is that those algorithms often look to, to sort of to us as humans, they look bizarre, alien, highly complex, um, yet they happen to achieve their purpose in sort of the optimal way. And I think that's a, sort of in the, in the limit of infinitely sophisticated technology, um, we'll see a lot more of these kinds of things where we can identify purpose by the fact that the thing that we're seeing is the thing that achieves what it achieves in kind of the most efficient possible way. Um, it's, a, it's a, you know, as we try and dig into sort of what, the, what this idea of purpose is, not 
in the limit of infinitely sophisticated technology, we kind of led to this whole chain of uh, taking a thing and asking how it sort of fits into our whole cultural history.